there is no effective solution to the food crisis without reintegrating Ukraine's food production as well as the food and fertilizer products produced by Russia and Belarus into world markets despite the war. Russia must permit the safe and secure export of grain stored in Ukrainian ports. Alternative transportation routes can be explored, even if we know that by itself they will not be enough to solve the problem. And Russian food and fertilizers must have unrestricted access to world markets without indirect impediments. Wheat has been the primary staple for the Middle East, Europe, North Africa, and parts of Asia for thousands of years. A bad year has meant starvation for millions. The French Revolution happened right after wheat prices spiked to take up over 80% of a worker's salary. In 1960s America, 16% of income went to food. But now it's half that. We live in, well, let me just say we lived in a world of ample food, of cheap food, and that world is about to change more rapidly than you thought. And it isn't climate change, fossil fuel prices, or even general inflation that's going to drive up the cost of wheat this year. It's the war in Ukraine. Today, we're going to use our experience growing our own food as a backdrop to discuss just how important wheat can be. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 48 on May 27th, 2022, coming to you out of Low Tech Institute's gardens in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be talking about the looming wheat crisis brought on by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We'll also have Institute updates. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find both of our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts. Unless you hear me doing the ad, someone else is making money on that advertising. While all of our podcast videos and other information are given freely, they do take resources to make. If you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. Thanks to Marilyn S., Donna B., Leanne S., Lane B., and Stephen L. for signing up lately. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website. Again, that's lowtechinstitute.org. And now right on to the interview with Bill Mosley. Uh, my first guest is Bill Mosley, the DeWitt Wallace Professor of Geography at McAllister College, who studies political ecology and agricultural, environmental, and developmental policy. In the past decade, he's worked with Save the Children, World Bank, Environmental Department, uh, USAID, the Peace Corps, um, and in his free time, he's active on Twitter, posting on all these topics under at William G. Mosley, that's M-O-S-E-L-E-Y. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming on, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here, Scott. Thanks for inviting me. Sure, glad to have you. Um, so we're going to talk about wheat today. And so I think I'm an archaeologist, so my ideas about wheat go really far back. Um, so I think it'd be just real quickly, I want to do a little table setting, and then we can jump right into what's going on right now. Um, so wheat's been used around the world as a staple for millennia because it stores calories really well without refrigeration. It makes uh, sedentary civilizations possible. Uh, and until a few centuries ago, most wheat was grown locally. Um, after the Industrial Revolution, uh, wheat <laughs> kind of jumped over <laughs> 10,000 years of wheat uh, history. But uh, since the Industrial Revolution, wheat's been traded internationally. And today, a few countries produce much of the world's wheat supply. The top producers are uh, China and India, but they eat most of what they produce. Um, and more than what they produce. And the top five exporters in descending order are Russia, the US, Canada, France, and Ukraine. Um, and I'll link to a page with a lot of really great infographics from Al Jazeera in the show notes. Um, so obviously, Bill, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has triggered a potential wheat crisis um, as Russian wheat won't be able to be sold on the international market and Ukrainian wheat is being destroyed as we speak. They're putting, I just heard a story on NPR this morning, they're putting mines in the fields of, mm -hmm. of Ukraine and destroying their tractors and taking all their oil. Um, anyway, a really interesting story this morning on NPR. Um, so first off, Bill, uh, how concerned are you and how concerned should we be about this year's wheat supply globally? And uh, what, what are the biggest challenges you see for this? Yeah, I think we should all be concerned. Um, wheat prices are at a 14 year high. Um, Russia and Ukraine together account for nearly 30% of global wheat exports. Um, 
and uh, Belarus and Russia also uh, export a lot of fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So I think this is not just a, a problem now, but I think it's going to be a problem for several years to come. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, because high energy prices, constrained um, access to fertilizers means mm. that farmers around the world um, are, are facing high input costs and, and are not mm. going to be able to plant as much. And in Ukraine in particular, like you noted from the story this morning, uh, their, their agricultural lands are being destroyed. And in some cases, it's going to take several years to bring those back into production. And mm -hmm. and Ukraine uh, it is really one of the wheat bread baskets of the world. And as mm -hmm. you noted, we have a, a handful of countries that produce the majority of um, the wheat that's exported. And then when mm -hmm. you literally blow up one of these bread baskets, uh, this mm -hmm. this creates a major problem. I think it's a particular problem for those countries that import a lot of wheat from the Black Sea region. So these are mm -hmm. mostly countries in North Africa and in the mm -hmm. Middle East. Yeah, I saw Egypt is trying to trade um, fertilizer for for wheat from all kinds of countries, Romania, and they were mm -hmm. scrambling. Recently, uh, India thought it was going to have a windfall this year um, because China's wheat was flooded out. And so they need to import more than usual. And now recently in the last two weeks, India's had a record heat wave that's destroyed a lot of the spring. Well, not a lot, but a, a significant enough portion of the spring, spring wheat. So they're actually going to have to import instead of export. Um, it feels yeah. to me kind of like the, the woman who swallowed a spider uh, with the interconnectedness of everything. So for example, like Russia and Belarusian fertilizers are cut off from the farmers in Brazil mm -hmm. who grow less soybeans, which feed animals in China, which become meat sold internationally. And so meat prices go up. It's, it's all, it, it's amazing how interconnected uh, we've become. Mm -hmm. So um, you uh, largely work on food issues or at least uh, a lot of your work is food issues in Africa mm -hmm. and the less, what I call the less industrialized parts of the world. How do you think people in these areas will be affected differently than those, say, where we are? You're in Minnesota right now, and I'm in Wisconsin. Correct. Yeah, so um, they are in a very precarious position. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to understand why they're in a precarious position. I mean, starting in the 1980s, um, Several African countries underwent uh, neoliberal economic reform uh, at the behest of the World Bank and the International Monetary mm -hmm. Fund. And part of those policies really encouraged them to focus on producing a few products for which mm -hmm. they had a comparative advantage. So, you know, mm -hmm. for many African countries, uh, other than minerals, this was commodity crops. So you focus on those, you know, export something like cotton, and then you you import food. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're deeply interconnected to the global food system mm -hmm. that kind of works OK as long as global food prices are relatively low. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, whenever there's a spike in global food prices, uh, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think in particular for lower income, middle income countries, they don't have as many resources. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Egypt earlier. Egypt is the largest importer of wheat in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Bread is a, is a staple. Um, it's mm -hmm. heavily subsidized by the government. Mm -hmm. But um, you know the government is struggling. They can only subsidize that so much, and um, <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of concern that you know you, you could see another Tiananmen Square and sort of uh, excuse me um, um, you know, unrest in Egypt because of of high of high uh, bread prices. Well, so um, it this this is a major problem for several mm -hmm. African countries, particularly those that import a lot of their food. Do they have to do folks? So I did my dissertation in Mexico in a, in a really small village, you know, um, and uh, a lot of them were subsistence farmers up until recently. And then the government started subsidizing, bought it, purchased in corn. So they were all looking for other ways to earn money. Um, some of them worked on my archaeological project when I was there um, and then they would buy corn instead of raise it. They had the knowledge to do that. And I imagine that this year they'll be putting in a lot more corn 
because they don't depend on outside fertilizers, they they grow it milpa, uh, so uh, Sweden agriculture in the in the forests around their villages. So they might be able to adapt and and go back to some of these practices. Is that something that's possible in places that you've had experience with? Yes, I mean we do see people are adaptable, um, and and they do shift. Mm -hmm. um, one of the countries I do a lot of work in is Mali in West Africa. And there, there was a, a strike of cotton farmers um, uh, in the mid 2000s um, because they were unhappy with the global price for cotton. And a lot of them shifted back into sorghum production. So mm -hmm. um, this, this, this is possible, you know, farmers aren't passive, they are adaptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you think, are, uh, have people become so uh, disconnected and, and bound into the international global trade that they'll have major f famine level disruptions or is it going to be more inconvenience and a reversion to uh, f maybe less, less desirable uh, crops and ways of, uh, of getting their food? Uh, how, how do you see that playing out? If this, I mean, it sounds like this is going to continue for a couple of years, the disruption. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think short term, there's a lot of concern. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think people need um, assistance making the transition. You know, if they have mm -hmm. enough time, they can they 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 can make that shift. But um, mm -hmm. You know, it takes at least another agricultural season to get a mm -hmm. different crop in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, if you were banking on selling a commodity and importing food crop, and the food crop isn't there or it's right. too expensive, that that's that's a major problem in the short run. Like uh, in the '80s, when Reagan decided, well, we don't need a strategic grain reserve; we'll sell that because it's not making interest. We'll put the money in the stock market, and then when there's a famine, we'll just buy grain from somewhere, which. <laughs> mm -hmm. historically speaking or you know as an archaeologist that that's not a good idea uh that hasn't turned out well in the past uh and so my yeah for wheat specifically because it takes almost an entire year uh to grow more unless you're doing spring wheat which isn't as as good as, as winter wheat uh you would have had to have been planting your wheat last year it's just not possible to adapt so quickly like you say mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. <laughs> So if, are there any maybe anecdotal or interesting uh, examples that might spring to your mind of, uh, of how people, you, you mentioned growing sorghum. Um, I, in anthropology, I learned about uh, how important sorghum was and uh, a lot of uh, communal agricultural activities in, in Africa um, and other places um, because uh, um, growing food is kind of a boom or a bust thing. You, all hands on deck to plant and then all hands on deck to harvest and process. Um, are those types of community and social institutions still extant in the communities or have they kind of disaggregated as people became more um, cash crop oriented? So um, uh, I'm gonna answer this in two ways and I'll talk both okay. about the local level and what's going uh -huh. on at the national level in these countries. Mm -hmm. I think I think um, several countries need to diversify. It's a problem if they're overly dependent on food imports. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a classic example would be Botswana, which is um, the world's largest producer of gem quality diamonds. They export mm -hmm. these things, but then they import ninety percent of their food. Mm -hmm. That that puts them in an extremely vulnerable position when um, supply chains are disrupted or food prices go up. So mm -hmm. they need to diversify. I do think um, after the 2007, 2008 global food crisis, um, mm -hmm. and in this crisis, it was rice prices that went up in particular, mm -hmm. there was a shift towards more local production or food self-sufficiency. Mm. Unfortunately, the, the way that was pursued, and a lot of this was pushed by international donors, was the new green revolution for Africa. So basically, mm -hmm. industrial food production techniques that are very energy intensive. Right. And so the, it becomes more expensive to produce that food. 
So I think the way forward, um, and this gets back at your question about sort of local knowledge and initiatives is agroecology. And agroecology is both a science and a social movement. Um, agroecologists think about farm fields like uh, simplified ecosystems and they're leveraging interactions between different crops, crops in the soil, crops in, mm -hmm. uh, in insects, leveraging those in a positive way to produce more food without external inputs. And so mm -hmm. it sounds like you have some experience with Mexico, a classic example there would be corn and beans and beans mm -hmm. are legume, they fix nitrogen that, mm -hmm. that the corn plant uses. And so this is, um, it's a science. I mean, there are people in the academy that are thinking about how do we use ecology to produce more food. But a lot of these ideas also come out of local communities and traditional knowledge. So I think it's a really interesting field that sort of bridges, you know, experiential knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as well as book knowledge out of the academy. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, a social movement. <laughs> because um, this uh, way to produce more food is sort of uh, threatening to uh, the established sort of agribusiness um, uh, <laughs> group because there's not much money to be made from ecology. Exactly. There are not a lot of inputs to sell. Yeah, and it's unmeasurable. I was just saying to a friend yesterday, I grow most of our food at home. And that's not measured in our GDP. I, you know, I, we spend, we don't spend thousands of dollars every year uh, because I've grown the food at home uh, and that's not measured in any metric in the economy at all, uh, at least in our country um, or anywhere as far as I know. Um, so you touched a little bit briefly on how energy dependent a lot of our modern industrial global um, food systems are. And that's kind of, uh, at least from my point of view, uh, looking back thousands of years, kind of an aberration. No, very few countries or a few, very few cultures depended on importing staples. A uh, notable example is Rome, which was notoriously unstable with its bread supplies from Egypt uh, during some periods. Um, and so part of what my organization does, and maybe there's some people, uh, fans of yours that are listening, uh, <laughs> or people associated with you that are listening. So what we talk about at the at my organization, Low Technology Institute, is thinking about how are we going to transition away from fossil fuel use in the future, um, specifically, well, most uh, problematic is going to be oil in the next uh, 25 to 40 years, depending on how we use the remaining supplies. And that's going to have a massive shift in, in growing food and uh, you talked about uh, potential Tiananmen Square type uh, uprisings in in Egypt as the pr bread prices go up. Well, the, we all well. We all I misspoke. Know. It's Tahir Square. Oh, Tahir Square. Oh, oh, I'm another. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Arab Spring. Yes. Arab Spring. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Tahir, Tahir Square. Square. Yeah. Uh, and uh, which I guess Tahir Square itself was somewhat like Tiananmen Square, asking for more democracy. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Okay. Uh, going on. Anyway, uh, the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, bread prices spiked right before the bread mm -hmm. uh, the French Revolution. Right. So it's it's not a new, um, not a new problem. So looking forward, and this is clearly speculative. We'll caveat that that you know you're an expert in the here and now and what's going on. But based on that kind of knowledge base, looking into the future in the United States or other industrialized countries. If you could <laughs> create a, a guiding uh, idea for, for the future of, of some sort of local, I imagine, local food security going forward, what sorts of social or technological sorts of things may be informed by uh, some of this agroecology or other things you've seen in Africa or other less developed areas? Um, are there... If you were the benevolent dictator of the future, what, what, what would our agriculture look like in 25, 30 years here in the U.S. that might maybe be more resilient or resistant to uh, a war in Europe <laughs> and our bread prices? Yeah, so I think agroecology is equally applicable in the global north as it is in the global south. I don't, you know, I don't really think of it in terms of low technology. I think I have a more sure. expansive view of technology, which can include what I would call sort of soft technology, know-how mm -hmm. and understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think 
in many cases, what we're, place, what we're replacing fossil fuel inputs with is, you know, understanding and know-how about how ecosystems and agro ecosystems function. Um, and so where I'm situated, you know, in the upper Midwest in the US, we have this agricultural landscape that's really dominated by uh, maize and soybeans. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, in, it's increasingly, it's very, very vulnerable to drought because, uh, you know, maize cross pollinates over this sort of two or three week period. And if you have a drought, then you're, it mm -hmm. creates havoc. We also have a situation where uh, animal production, which used to be integrated with crop production is increasingly mm -hmm. separated from that. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, these intensive sort of hog operations or chicken production facilities, which are major, major producers of, of mm -hmm. pollution. Um, and um, so I, I really think that we need to go back to a more diverse system, <laughs> mm. um, a greater mix of crops. We need to sort of reintegrate crop and animal mm. production. Um, mm. And this is gonna be more resilient to climate change. It's gonna be less energy intensive. It's gonna be mm. less polluting. Um, and it's gonna provide, you know, more nutritious food for people. I mean, mm -hmm. where I live in Minnesota, 90% of the crops we produce here are not consumed directly. I mean, a lot of it's mm. for ethanol production or high fructose mm. corn syrup. So mm -hmm. when, when it, you know, certain scientists say we feed the world, frankly, that's, that's, that's a lot of BS <laughs> yeah. because a lot of yeah. it's not being used to feed people. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think there are some pretty significant obstacles in the way. Mm -hmm. One is the U.S. agricultural subsidy system that really mm -hmm. encourages the, the production of certain commodities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have we, we have a super lively, um, you know, mix of vegetable producers in the metro area where I live, but none mm -hmm. of them get support from the government. It's all for the big mm -hmm. commodity producers. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. the other, I think, issue is that... Um, agroecology different ways of knowing have really mm -hmm. been marginalized in mm -hmm. um, the agricultural schools across the United States. Mm -hmm. And frankly, part of that is schools of agriculture, departments of agronomy are highly subsidized by corporate ag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think this transition needs to be driven by different ways of knowing Going, which means we, we do need to get this into our colleges and universities mm -hmm. so we can produce a new generation of farmers who's who's gonna really reinvent our food systems yeah it seems that uh <laughs> the soil right now is seen as just a sponge for mpk inputs and outcome plants mm -hmm. and the you know the emerging fields of or the emerging understanding of the microbiome of the soil i'm interested i'm excited to see how that changes maybe our our uh, some of our, our our view of agriculture, but yeah, I I come from uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, northern Minnesota, and I had grandpa mm -hmm. in North Dakota, and it was all one way. This is true. I'm just not picking on him at all. Uh, it's true of all industrial mm -hmm. agriculture. It really seems such a one way street from you know natural gas largely producing um, nitrogen in the factories, the Haber Bosch process, to the farms to the fields, to the, you know, uh, to the, to the factories, to the market, to us. And there's no circularity in that economy. And it's only possible because of this glut of fossil fuels we have tapped into right now that obviously is uh, so regionally constrained that when we have these global disruptions, it has ripple effects because we've kind of chained ourselves into this, in one point of view, efficient, model for feeding lots of people but it's only efficient in the it's like burning a candle at both ends it's not it's 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 not actually efficient it's 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 it takes a lot of resources to do and we don't have those resources to to continue using into the future it makes me <laughs> somewhat concerned but um yeah what do you what do you do <laughs> sorry it's kind of not really well, a question I, just I, I i i do think Please. this is um, crises are um, 
potential moments for change. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not naive. I know there's an establishment that will do everything in their power to sort of maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. But um, I think especially crises that are prolonged. So we have mm -hmm. two crises stacked on top of one another now, the, the war in Ukraine coming off of two years of COVID. Mm -hmm. I do think there's, you know, people are reacting to this. The farmers around the world are changing the way they grow crops. And I think mm -hmm. if they are sort of nudged in the right direction, we can get a less energy intensive food system. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm a supporter of President Biden in many ways, but I was very frustrated that, you know, he's decided, I think, because of high fuel prices to sort of double down on ethanol production. Yeah, and I think I saw that's that the wrong way to go. I, I think we need to encourage you know, more ecological approaches to agriculture, and then it's going to be mm -hmm. less vulnerable to these to these price fluctuations and better for the environment and less vulnerable mm -hmm. to climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 easy to revert to the mean, I guess. Or not easy, but it's 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 tempting uh, to do this, and we see this, you know, uh, in Mesopotamia when their fields became, you know, uh, saline or too much salt in their soil, they they didn't. Mm -hmm question the method of of farming they just did more <laughs> and did more of a bad thing and it, it caused uh instability and and the collapse of the the larger more complex society the the peasants were fine but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the complexity that 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 fails and i'm afraid not afraid uh, i'm concerned that you know in the united states we're so far removed from even the the cultural knowledge our grandparents maybe who went through the depression or great grandparents uh, who went through the depression, who had that knowledge to fall back on to be able to grow and subsidize a lot of their own foods. I think in the U.S., we're having to relearn that. And you know, for me, I grow my own wheat, but I'm having to figure all this stuff out because I don't know anybody. Uh, I've never been taught by anyone how to. I'm looking at farming manuals from the 1850s and stuff like that to try and understand what they're saying and and, and relearn some of this stuff because it's. It's, there's no money for it. Um, so we did a potato study on non-mechanized mm -hmm. ways, efficient ways to grow potatoes. And there was, I did a literature review before I, when I was applying for a grant, there's nothing done because all the money goes for big ag, um, you know, mechanized. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just not uh, the support there. And I, I hope maybe this will be a, a change. Um, and hopefully, as you say, uh, a nudge rather than a catastrophic mm -hmm. uh mad max sort of scenario where we have to change very quickly maybe yeah. this will wake people up um and it'll be a short-term pain but perhaps push us in a, in a better direction mm -hmm. i hope um are there are there any uh, closing thoughts you want to leave us with as we're wrapping up our i don't want to uh over i don't want to abuse your time i appreciate you uh coming on to talk today is there um I saw you recently had a article out in um, high level panel of experts, uh, the Committee on World Food Security, um, which I'll, I'll link to in the show notes. Are, are there any other uh, things that you've had out recently that might speak more to this or have uh, different perspectives or uh, open up different areas that that uh, we didn't get to talk about today? But, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I, so I think I. Well, I am currently working on a book on decolonizing African agriculture. I hope that's oh, out in about a year. But I would like to just end on a more positive note. I, I know <laughs> um, it's easy yeah. to get pessimistic during uh, a crisis. And, um, you know, the article to which I think you're referring um, on the site by the high level of panel of experts oh, for food FAO, security and nutrition yeah. mm -hmm. is, is, is basically about, you know, is the global food system on the cusp of a major change? And mm -hmm. I do think there's the potential here, if we manage it well, to sort of make a shift. And so mm -hmm. um, I think by my nature, I tend to be more optimistic. And so I, I'm, um, uh, I think we have to dream for a better future mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, and push towards that, um, you know, rather than... Um, being paralyzed by concerns about um, the old system collapsing mm -hmm. because we mm -hmm. have an incredibly vulnerable global food system that's been built over decades by past um, 
policy initiatives that really mm -hmm. doubled down on this energy intensive system that's dependent on long distance trade. And we know from a variety of shocks over the last couple of years that it's not working, right? Mm -hmm. And on yeah. top of that, you know, malnutrition in all its forms from, you know, acute food insecurity to obesity are growing mm -hmm. problems around the world. So, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, you know, we, we, the system has to change. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely hope so. Um, and yeah, and yeah. I find for me, um, part of the reason I started this organization was from feeling a little helpless as an as a individual in this kind of changing system around us. And so, you know, every day I do, I get to work in my office and then I go out and I, I work in my garden and I'm, you know, actively doing something that has tangible benefits for my family and my community. Um, and I, I think that for me, that for me, that's a, that's a big help. And I think it could be a, a catharsis for a lot of people who, who, feel caught in this in this large system that we're all that we're all a part of so um yeah. so yeah i re really appreciate you coming and, and spending a, a yeah. half hour ch thanks chatting very with much, me about Scott. this thanks again to bill for taking the time to talk to me uh, so we can anticipate the crisis response of the current food distribution system wheat corn and rice will be moved around the world with ships trains and trucks all using fossil fuels to get where they're going and while this will help alleviate the distribution problem it won't stop two things from happening um, the short-term problem is that the grain supply will be down this year thanks to the things we've already talked about from the destroyed wheat fields and equipment in ukraine and the inability for russia to sell its grain to the west uh, to the great reduction of fertilizer availability affecting much of the northern hemisphere's planting season right now. The long-term problem is depending on long-distance transport of staples, and this is where the Institute's perspective comes into play. We're looking a quarter century into the future. As I've said before, no ancient societies relied on long-distance transport of staples. They didn't have the easy power of gas and diesel to move things around. When these are no longer available, it will make the most sense to grow our staples regionally and this will force many of us to change how we eat and how we get our food food prices in cities will rise and perhaps we'll see people begin to move out of cities especially if we're able to continue the trend towards remote work growing staples means we need space and know-how we have the space in this country to grow enough food for ourselves um, at last check we have about seven acres per person and now i realize that not all of this land is arable or farmable but even still an acre per person is more than enough space to grow all the food a person needs. It's even enough room to support some animals, uh, chickens, a pig, a cow or goats for each family. But our future of local food may take many forms. People across the modern and historic world give us models to test. Just recently, for example, we've all heard of a kibbutz in Israel, where people pool their resources and work together in agricultural production and social life. Americans, though, might gravitate towards a moshav model, also from Israel, where a village has some common work, say the wheat and potato fields, and some shared resources like tractors, workshops, and other specialized equipment you don't use very often. But each family would have its own individual home, land, and garden. In whatever form your community takes in the future, growing wheat, corn, potatoes, and other staples would be an existential issue. In the last podcast, I mentioned the statistic that a person could grow a third of his or her annual calories in 40 hours of labor growing potatoes. And to grow this amount of calories for 40 people, you'd need only an acre. Wheat, on the other hand, is measured in bushels and that fills about eight gallons and weighs about 60 pounds. And from that, a person would get about two thirds of the weight in flour, so about 40 pounds of flour per bushel. That amounts to about 66,000 calories. Now, I've been growing my own wheat for a few years now, um, and industrial wheat production, uh, in the fields you might see around the country, they get about 45 to 50 bushels per acre. This is about double pre-industrial rates. Pre-industrial yields range from about 10 to 30 bushels per acre. My own yield fluctuates as I'm experimenting with planting methods, but I can count on about 20 to 25 bushels per acre. At that rate, to provide a third of one's calories from wheat, one would have to have about four bushels of wheat per person. That means six people could live off the wheat from an acre in my current production method. Uh, but first you might be thinking, okay, that's a lot of calories from wheat. But remember, before industrialization, people regularly ate one to two pounds of bread a day. Uh, 
A third of your calories would be about 12 ounces of bread. And now I know people are trying to move away from bread and carbohydrates and all these different things and gluten. Um, if you're making sourdough bread, that really, and, and using long rises uh, in, your, in your bread making process, that really alleviates a lot of the problems that people have with gluten because it breaks down enzymes. But we'll talk about that a different day. I've made a video on planting homescale grains on our YouTube channel, and if you just search for Low Tech Institute on YouTube or click on the videos link on our website, you'll find it. Um, also, we're going to make videos about how to harvest and process grains later in the year. It does take time uh, to prepare the field, plant the seeds, weed the field, harvest the stalks, let it dry, thresh it, and grind it. Each step has a learning curve, and that must be dealt with. Specialized tools make uh, homescale grains possible without considerable amounts of times wasted in futile repetitive work. And I've been doing it a few years and I get better each year. And the reason I mention all this, our videos, all the different steps, is it's a lot more involved to grow and process and use wheat than say potatoes. Um, this is why I argue potatoes are a more important staple than wheat, but I think many of us would be a lot happier in our lives if we had local wheat available. And so what I'm really trying to say is, now is the time to think about learning to grow grains. Few of us have anyone around with direct knowledge of how to grow wheat or other grains without mechanization. Since the 1930s, tractors, reapers, and other machines have taken over um, agriculture, taken over that skilled labor that is needed for growing grains. Ask anybody who's tried to use a scythe without any instruction. It is, it is skilled labor. In a century, we've lost the people with first-hand experience, so we're stuck learning by trial and error after reading descriptions in Victorian era farm manuals like uh, the Book of the Farm from the UK or watching video after video on YouTube. Uh, maybe you live by traditional communities like the Amish or uh, certain Mennonites that might be able to teach you these skills, but that isn't available everywhere and they don't all practice that anymore. Uh, by having people take up this as a hobby now, we're able to better supply our own local futures. Someone local would have to have the equipment and know how to use it when diesel isn't available for tractors. We, for example, will be offering our annual workshop where people can come and learn to harvest and process wheat this summer. Details will be available on the website soon, but it will be in around mid-July. If you want to hear about when we're having classes, head to our website and sign up for the listserv. Or uh, you can become a patron uh, or member and you get to sign up early and uh, for a discount. Wheat has been the primary staple for societies from Central Asia through the Middle East to all of Europe and now much of the Americas starting almost 10,000 years ago. We've seen ups and downs with the supply, causing famine or baby booms. But our collective fate has been tied to this crop for millennia. This is the first global wheat crisis since the 1930s. Strikingly, that's when the Soviet policy of collectivization shattered the Ukrainian wheat industry. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, as they say. So, although we have a better transportation and communication system now, will we, will we be able to move and distribute food in a way to prevent widespread hunger? This is a question of political and social will as much as it is the physical presence or absence of enough grain around the world. We have to choose whether or not we're gonna let this be a famine. And now for a brief recap of the research we have going on around the Institute. Spring is our busiest time and we continue to churn ahead with a few research projects. The compost study is being revamped. We have been testing a system to capture the off gases from a compost pile and push them through a grow bread. Now uh, gone are the heavy, difficult to move boxes that we initially tried and now we are testing a series of piles on the ground covered by a tarp to capture the off gases and pump them under a grow bed. We'll have a full episode on this as the study concludes next spring, but in the meantime, you can check out more under the research tab on our website, lowtechinstitute.org. The bees are also doing their thing at our research apiary next door. We've had two years of terrible winter survival in our attempt to breed mite-tolerant honeybees. We're getting close to a conclusion in this study, but unfortunately, it will not be very optimistic in our findings, and we'll have to think about new ways forward. I anticipate having a podcast about this uh, in a few months. That's it for this week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted by me, Scott Johnson, and our production team has doubled. I'm glad to introduce and welcome Hina Suzuki as our new podcast producer and editor who will be helping make this a more regular and engaging podcast. Welcome. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed this free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. 
Thank you to our Forester and Land Steward level members, Marilyn Skirpon and the Hanvises for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute, membership, and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media and reach me directly at scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was Time Lapse off an album from the same name by Zylo Zico. That song is under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike non-commercial license and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike license. All this means you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks and take care.